Good afternoon. We're here today to talk about a newly published guidelines for anticoagulation in the annals of thoracic surgery that was just published this month. This is a compilation of all of the issues related to anticoagulation. And since 1910, when some of the very first open heart surgery cases were performed and heparin was used, we have now a very comprehensive discussion of the issues related to giving heparin, including heparin uh, antibodies, which can cause severe problems associated with bypass. And thus, these guidelines are very valuable for you to read in the sense that if you use cardiopulmonary bypass and use heparin, this gives you a very, very concise but very informative uh, way to deal with patients that have heparin antibodies. We have a very good group of people here this afternoon, and I am here with Dr. Guy Gatano, and I'm going to introduce him to you, and I'm sure he'll have a few words for you. Uh, I'm Gaetano Payone. I'm the uh, division head of cardiac surgery at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and I, I want to echo uh, Dr. Hammond's words. Uh, it, it, we, we take the anticoagulation and cardiopulmonary bypass pretty much for granted. Uh, you know, I, I think it's probably fair to say, I think, that the, the typical cardiac surgeon, myself included, uh, maybe our, uh, to some degree our knowledge is limited to go ahead and give the heparin, and then at the end of the case, okay, we're ready to you know, close up, let's go ahead and reverse with some protamine. And oftentimes, we're not really all that cognizant of the issues that, uh, that, that can come about from that. And uh, as Dr. Hammond mentioned, the uh, perhaps most critical one is related to the incidence of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and the complications associated with that. And uh, if you're not familiar with it and you're fortunate enough not to have seen it in your practice, you probably will at some point. And the, the ways of dealing with it to, to in large degree are pretty well spelled out in the guidelines. Uh, including uh, use of alternative methods of anticoagulation, uh, which uh, for those of us who have been forced on rare occasion to do that is uh, not always the most pleasant uh, way to, to have to deal with that problem. And so what we try to do in that setting is actually to uh, try and get the patient to wait two or three months. The antibodies tend to go away. You repeat the test. And then you can take them, uh, as you all well know, to the operating room, use heparin in a routine fashion, uh, provided that you don't redose them at some point afterwards, and that's generally pretty safe. Thank you very much. So, usually the person in charge of administering the heparin and the protamine is the perfusionist. We're lucky to have uh, Mr. Paul here, who is a perfusionist and an officer in AMSEC, which is the perfusion uh, group the, the, that runs the lives of their perfusionists. And so, would you like to make a few comments? Absolutely. Uh, you know, first of all, I think I'd like to start with just saying that, that these types of guidelines that are jointly done across all the professions involved with cardiac surgery, with the perfusion, uh, with the American Society of Extracorporeal Technology, as, as you mentioned, uh, the Society of Cardiac Anesthesiologists, and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. I, it's, it's the right approach. It's it, the collaboration to get all three groups that are, are intimately involved with managing the care of these patients together uh, to share expertise and review the literature together. Um, it, we certainly enjoy the opportunity to sit at the table and, and bring a perfusionist perspective. So for that, we're, we're very appreciative. Um, you know, I think I, I would echo Dr. Payone's sentiments about, you know, the guidelines, why they're an incredibly useful tool to some extent, they help highlight some of the gaps in the knowledge and, and lead to some of the future research that, that really is needed in this area. Um, over the evolution of bypass, we certainly, the, a lot of the, the early, the seminal studies that guide our, our anticoagulation strategies today were done 20, 30 years ago, and technology is, is advanced, not only in uh, circuit design and, and surface coatings, but in the instruments that we use, um, some of the early instruments were, were wildly inaccurate. Uh, we, they're still challenging today, but they, they are getting to be better instruments to help guide our management. Um, and certainly, the last few years have seen variation in the potency of heparin dosing. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges in this area, and I, I, I think it's wonderful to, to review the literature 
and to help support the community and, and give them evidence-based guidelines to, to guide their practice. So you would be in favor not just for the MD component of this multidisciplinary group to be familiar with these guidelines, but also for the perfusionists as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's one of the challenges in producing documents like this is really getting penetration and getting those guidelines into motion out in the field. Um, any opportunity to, to send a, a joint message, I think just makes the message that much more louder and clearer uh, and it can really have an impact on care. Well, this is Dr. Richard Engelman who's had tremendous experience uh, with cardiopulmonary bypass and has written several articles. Would you like to make some comments? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction and basically I agree with what my peers here have all echoed in regard to to the uh, ability to handle anticoagulation and the importance, clearly, of addressing the guidelines, which are uh, very important for us to understand and to deal with. And in terms of my experience through more than 40 years of cardiac surgery, is that uh, in the beginning, we really relied solely upon unfractionated heparin and had very little, if any, information about heparin antibodies. And uh, it took a lot of experience before we understood what heparin-induced thrombocytopenia really was. And basically, it is, as uh, mentioned by Guy, that it is an essential ingredient of our concern about patients who are susceptible to uh, this kind of an issue and it's one of the uh, advantages that we now possess. And the other issue I would just like to bring up is the uh, effects of administering protamine and the technique for administering protamine, which is often given by the perfusionist and in our institution is administered by the anesthesiologist. And the ability to understand what a protamine reaction is is another issue that is addressed very vibrantly in this uh, guideline article and I think is truly an essential part of uh, not only uh, the cardiac surgeons and the perfusionists understanding and reading the article but also cardiac anesthesiology. Thank you. Very nicely said. So in summary I believe that it's very important for every surgeon who does cardiac surgery and even if you don't use cardiopulmonary bypass, there are situations where you will need to use heparin. And to have the uh, knowledge to be able to handle this very powerful but very helpful drug is very important. I see in the literature now where surgeons who are doing so-called off-pump surgery are very happy with it and it seems to be uh, a useful uh, addition to our armamentarium. But also, at that particular time, you have to use heparin when you're opening small blood vessels and sewing grafts to them, and so the patients do need to be heparinized. So we're very, very, very pleased with this addition of the annals of thoracic surgery and very pleased with these guidelines. And I recommend that uh, all those persons who do cardiac surgery uh, look at these guidelines. You don't have to memorize them, but at least have have it in your mind where to go if you have a problem. So thank you very much for listening to this discussion and uh, we appreciate your uh, willingness to uh, listen to us and I'm sure it will help you with your practice. Thank you.